Hello, everyone. Welcome to our English conversation program. Today, we're very happy to invite you again to join us for the guest hour. This month, our guest is Dr. William Mom, professor of music at the University of Michigan. Hello, everybody. This is Beth Higgins. It's certainly nice to be here with you, and I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to Dr. Mom. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, Professor Marm, we are delighted to have you on our program today. It's a pleasure to be invited, Mr. Togo. Hello, everyone. I understand that this is not your first visit to Japan. So uh, when was your first visit, Professor Marm? My first visit to Japan was in 1955. I came there and stayed for two years to 1957. And may I ask why you first came? I came to study Japanese music. I came to write a Ph.D. thesis on Nagauta, which is a form of music used in the Kabuki theater. Mm. I see. And then uh, what brought you to Japan this time, may I ask? Well, I've come back to Japan to look at Nagauta again, but this time I'm looking at the compositions of one Nagauta composer, Yamada Shotaro. And are you staying in Japan on any... Uh, program uh, or any grant or something? Yes, I have the good fortune of being a fellow of the Japan Foundation, which invited me to be here for an incomplete year. And then I also am on sabbatical from my university, the University of Michigan. So those two funds make it possible for me to be here for an entire year. Actually, I'm doing really three things. I'm t studying the compositions of Yamada Shotaro. I'm also working with a Japanese scholar and an Australian scholar, studying together one particular scene of a Gidayu play, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, which is the Bunako Theater, the puppet theater. And third, I'm actually taking Naruto singing lessons, because at the U University of Michigan, we have a Naruto performing group, entirely of American students, oh. and uh, the most difficult part for me, of course, is the singing. So I'm taking singing lessons. Mm. And since we are going to ask you about your professional career and experiences during the second half of this interview, uh, let us concentrate on your personal background by way of introduction today. And could you tell us uh, about your educational background? I took a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in composition from Northwestern University. And I worked uh, as a teacher of music theory and composition. And then later I took a PhD, a doctorate, mm -hmm. uh, in ethnomusicology at the University of California in Los Angeles. Uh, what do you mean by composition? Does it mean uh, I was composing a piece of music? I was a composer. I, uh -huh. my, both my bachelor's and master's involved composition, and my original field was composing for modern dance. Uh -huh. But uh, I did that for quite a while, actually. For a while, I even had a studio in New York City. But uh, I'm a composer with exceptionally good taste, so I stopped composing. <laughs> uh, I, left, I left the piano and I pick up the typewriter, and I've made a much better living ever since. I'm sorry, now I'll ask you just a short question about modern dance. It happens to be a hobby of mine. Did you work with Martha Graham or people like that in New York? Yes, I, I played for Graham, for Jose Limon, for Doris Humphrey, for all the, uh, all the people people? of that particular era. Yes. It was a very good business, but <laughs> yes, I, I find, I became, as you know, I don't write compositions, I write books. And I find it a little more rewarding. Well, I'd like to ask you, when you first became interested in Japanese music? It was actually during the period that I was a composer of pianist for dance. I was playing uh, the piano at a dance camp, a summer dance camp called Jacob's Pillow in Massachusetts. And uh, they, every single weekend, they had a different show. And one weekend, the show they had was a group called Debbie Ja and her Java Bali Dancers. That was my very first time to ever see non-Western dance and to hear non-Western music. 
to make a long story short, uh, instead of going back to uh, Northwestern University, I took a semester off and went on the road as their one-man Indonesian orchestra. I avoid um, and your uh, friends uh, and the radios can't see me, but I'm six foot one. But uh, the uh, I wore the Indonesian costume, and I had a you know, an Indonesian hat on. So it took my red hair to the show. I didn't have a mustache then, and I used makeup to make my face nice uh, Indonesian color. And I sat on the floor, so you couldn't tell I was six feet tall. So I toured the United States as a one-man Indonesian orchestra playing Indonesian instruments, which I learned in New York. And uh, so that got me started. And, and from there on, you see, I kept being a dilettante. I read all the books, you know, all the Oriental things. And in the long run, I realized that you either have to do something more thoroughly or forget about it. Most people who deal with other people's music deal with it in a very pleasant but superficial way. I mean, the Jews fell in love with Indian music, and he wrote, and uh, Ravel did too, and there's the Chinese music, and they did all kinds of imitations. But they were imitating the surface. Mm-hmm. And if you are a scholar, you begin to realize the surface is not enough. But to go deeper into the surface, into the beyond the surface, you have to really concentrate. So eventually, I realized now that I was not a good composer. Uh, stopped composing, went back to university, and took a PhD to try to learn the techniques by which I could understand Asian music better. And the part of Asia I chose was Japan. And Professor Mom, I understand that you help uh, those students who are interested in, in, in practicing Nagaruta, um, but I don't think that's all you do at your university. And uh, what are you currently uh, doing uh, as a professor? Well, I am a professor of musicology, mm-hmm. that's Ongaku Gaku. And uh, I know that means I teach regular history of music, which normally means that little part of the world called Europe, which I do deal with. There are some good composers there, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we also deal with what's called ethnomusicology, which is the study of music and culture, and also looks at the music in a proper contemporary sense of the world of music. Um, I'd like to ask you something about your students and their interest in, uh, in their interest, I should say, in Japanese music. I don't know, but I would guess that the exposure is fairly limited. Oh, of course, their exposure is limited to what they get at the University of Michigan, I suppose. But uh, in the United States, uh, the people, everybody in the United States is a foreigner. Except the American Indian. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a great sensitivity that the world is different. And a, a great interest in various kinds of world music. For example, at the University of Michigan, we have a complete Indonesian gamelan. And we have people who go into Japanese music. And while I'm here on my sabbatical, they are, we have a visiting professor, they're all learning to play Chinese music. We've also had Indian music. Thailand music, or well, even from any part of the world is possible, but, and our students just naturally have a little more international interest because it is an internationally oriented university. I should also point out they have a very strong uh, Japanese language program, so there are people there anyhow who have some intellectual vested interest in doing something Japanese. Mm-hmm. And they seem to be living in what we call shitamachi in Tokyo, and presumably living just like a Japanese, or perhaps in an even more traditional way about the average Japanese. And is it because you enjoy living that way, or does your academic background require you to live in that mode? Well, it's a little of both, mm-hmm. because uh, the field of ethnomusicology means music in culture. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to study Edo period music for a living, you know, dance <laughs> And uh, besides, I do actually enjoy it. Mm-hmm. For example, practicing shamisen, you really need a tatami room. And uh, uh, it's just more convenient. Uh, but I actually, you see, I, my particular field of research is the theatrical music of the Edo period. I see. Mm-hmm. Therefore, it's very appropriate. So it makes me somewhat an Edo core, you see. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, uh, I just, very honestly, enjoy it very much. 
much better than living in an apartment. Mm, I'm glad you do. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about Japanese life and culture itself. Are there particular aspects that you find most interesting? Everything? <laughs> well, I think anyone who accepts everything is not mm. very intellectually adept. Uh, I it's awfully hard to summarize a culture as rich as Japan, but I suppose the thing that most, I am most often am aware of is I appreciate the Japanese sense of detail. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do something, do it right. Mm -hmm. And I think that perhaps is the, you know, some other parts of the world are a little careless, you know. If the job gets done, it gets done. But I've noticed, uh, even the smallest job, that somehow, if you're just buying a package in, in, in a store or even a, in a uh, grocery store, the person wraps it correctly. They just don't slop it in. And I find that particularly appealing. I, I think the most powerful one I recall was being in a sushi ya, and the apprentice was cutting the vegetables. And the older man came to him and said, Dami, Dami, and took it away from me and cut it and made it in the most beautiful miniature pine tree. Mm -hmm. He's just going to eat it. It's only a vegetable. But you want it to be a beautiful vegetable you ate. I find it very, very appealing. I understand that term, but I'd like to ask you, does that have any relationship to music, do you think, Japanese music? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's just, uh, in everything you do in Japanese music, it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Just the playing and the singing and everything, half of it is not in sound. That's another reason, by the way, I have to come back to Japan. I have, or the university has, a collection of maybe six thousand dollars worth of Japanese recordings. Mm -hmm. So the sound is there, mm -hmm. but the sound is not all there is to music. Particularly uh, Japanese music, in this case, I appreciate the fact that how you play it and how you hold your body, how any it's like tea, it's like tea ceremony. It's not the flavor of the tea that counts at all. It's the entire. Motion. I think that particular thing is, uh, is very much a part of Japanese music. Also, from a detail standpoint, the kinds of things that make a, a um, correct performance would sometimes almost be inaudible to someone who didn't know. But in all fairness, that is true in any great art music. To change the subject slightly, uh, Professor Marmon, you just mentioned earlier that uh, the University of Michigan has uh, good courses in the study of Japanese. And is that where you first uh, began to study Japanese? Or can you share some of your language learning experiences with us? Well, unfortunately, I did not begin at the University of Michigan. I studied elsewhere. And the first uh, lessons I took before I came to Japan uh, were in old books. So they taught me how to speak to anybody who, when I came to Japan in 1955, mm -hmm. I would be able to talk to anybody who was 70 years old or older. Anyone younger than that would not be using the same language I had learned to speak. Uh, but when I came to Japan, of course, I was dealing entirely with traditional musicians who speak only Japanese. So, in a way, I would say that I learned my Japanese uh, on the street. Mm -hmm. You just figured out here and there. I, well, I mean... I was speaking all day long to people in Japanese, and I had to learn it. I got a private tutor at first, but then after that, it was just simply every single day, every single lesson was in Japanese, so I had no choice. So that's how you became fluent in spoken Japanese. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, you brought a good point. The biggest problem there was kanji. Mm. Well, Professor Baum, I'm afraid we're running out of time, and I'm sure our listeners would like to hear more about your interesting experiences. So, would you mind coming over again next Saturday? It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Everybody, this concludes today's guest hour. So long. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to our English conversation program. How are you doing today? We hope you're doing fine. This is Katsu Akitogo inviting you to join me again for the guest hour together with... Brett Higgins. Hello everybody. The guest for this month is Dr. William Malm, Professor of Music at the University of Michigan. 
He's now in Japan at the invitation of the Japan Foundation. Let's see what he has to say. Welcome back to our program, Professor Mon. Thank you for inviting me again, Beth. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by quickly summing up what we talked about last week for the benefit of those who missed that program. Professor Mong is here in Tokyo on a Japan Foundation fellowship and is studying theater music, specifically music in the Kabuki and Bunraka theater. Well, Dr. Mong, my first question today is about Japanese traditional music. May I ask what makes it unique compared with other uh, with music in other countries? Well, the particular quality of Japanese music that uh, is most striking to me is it's a uh, it is a linear music. It goes in lines, and it's transparent lines. You can hear each line. Hmm. In other words, if you listen to Western music, let's compare with Western music. There are other musics, but let's compare with Western music. In Western music, in traditional music, what you hear is a line on top and a line on the bottom. I call it polarity, you know, some negative and positive. You have a bass line and a melody line, and you thicken out the entire middle part with vertical sounds called chords. It's a very thick very powerful structure. Japanese music runs the totally opposite direction. It, its lines going parallel, and they have a different sound. For example, if you listen to a no drama, you don't hear everything melted together like a dance band. You hear the no drama drum separate from the singer, the singer separate from the flute. It's very separate sounds moving together in time, and it's absolutely uh, fascinating to me. I should point out to you, by the way, it's also fascinating to contemporary composers of Western music because they are looking for that kind of linear, transparent quality. If you think of Japanese uh, painting, particularly uh, ink painting, sunye, the same kind of linearity, the same kind of line, mm. that's what's very special about Japanese music. And I understand that you play uh, some Japanese musical instruments yourself. Uh, what aren't they, may I ask? Uh, I have taken lessons on the shamisen, mm -hmm. and then uh, on Japanese singing of Nagaruka, mm -hmm. also Japanese singing of Gidayu. Mm -hmm. I've also taken lessons on the hayashi, the instruments of the kabuki theater, that is the otatsumi, the kotatsumi, the taiko, the takeboe, and no kan. Wow, so many. But you know, just for us laymen, uh, shamisen has only three strings and uh, uh, other instruments. For instance, the piano has a lot more keys to uh, put your fingers on, and uh, so shamisen seems to be easy to play, but uh, do you have any comments on that? The piano is so much easier to play, it's totally mechanical. All you have to do is hit the button and it goes off. The shamisen is much closer to the violin. There is no, There are no finger positions on the fingerboard. An auto-tune shamisen is just as auto-tune as an auto-tune violin. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge of a, of a shamisen is a, is a challenge of a Western violin. The piano is a totally mechanical instrument. Mm -hmm. You could play the piano if you could see the key. But a, a shamisen and a violin, you have to hear to play. Well, Professor Tobo just asked you about uh, some of the uh, difficult points of um, playing Japanese instruments, but I'd like to ask you, Personally, what are some of the problems you have when you play them? That's a difficult question. I, I suppose the hardest thing to see to remember is that it took me only, it only took me 20 years, by the way, but I finally figured out something which I should have known a long time ago, namely that the function of a musical lesson in a very traditional situation, let's say in a constant drum, is not musical. Mm. The function of the lesson is a way towards enlightenment. And you have to enter into it spiritually. Now, very honestly, that is true of Western art music as well. A really great violinist, a really great pianist is totally into a sort of a, a special experience. But normally speaking, a music lesson doesn't feel it. I've had a singular good fortune in Japan of having teachers who are not just teaching me music. We often talk in Japanese lessons but the hi kyoko, or the hinitsu na koto, the secret thing. And we never talk about it really, the what it is. The problem is yours. But that's a very Buddhist concept. The mm -hmm. problem of any enlightenment is yours. 
It doesn't come from the teacher. The teacher only shows you the path. So I find that that's probably the most challenging thing is to get yourself spiritually in the condition to play the instrument beautifully. I've had, by the way, in that context, I've had the same experience with Western students. I can remember teaching a Western student the taiko, the stick drum, the taiko stick drum, and he was very excited to learn it. He learned one pattern, another pattern, another pattern, and then came to a very famous pattern called kakira. But I couldn't teach it to him because he was not spiritually ready for me to teach it to him. And even I did it. She's in you understand? I didn't intellectualize it. It just happened. I realized he couldn't play that yet. Now, when I say he couldn't play that yet, I don't mean physically. Mm -hmm. I mean aesthetically, spiritually. Can I just ask you one uh, more question about the technical side of playing the uh, Japanese instruments? And uh, Do you have any difficulty uh, reading the musical notes? I'm sure the kind of notes uh, you use for the Japanese instruments are different from those for Western music. Yes, I think that you have to remember in any kind of music, you can use the old architect uh, model, form follows function. Mm -hmm. The kind of notation you use for an instrument in Japan relates to what the instrument is. Now, in Western music, we are very mechanical. We have one form of notation that works, is supposed to work for all teaching, called five-line notation. It's totally inappropriate for Japanese music. And uh, actually, no, I find it very helpful for what I want to learn to use the Japanese notation. Of course, the major problem is always the kanji. Mm -hmm. That's what you uh, uh, mentioned at the end of the last program uh, in relation to your experience in learning Japanese. Well, I understand you're concerned with uh, ethno musicology, it's quite mouthful for me, but can you tell us what it means and how it's related to, say, our everyday life? It is a very appropriate contemporary science. The ethno of ethnomusicology comes from ethnology, which means culture. Mm -hmm. The musicology comes from the science of music. And so when you're doing ethnomusicology, you are studying music in culture, or music as part of a culture. Some of my colleagues who are in the field are anthropologists, some are sociologists, and some, like me, are musicians. They study music and culture, and they don't try to make it just one particular culture that is politically or economically dominant in the world at a particular time. It may be that one culture, but it doesn't have to be. Therefore, some people study music in some part of Africa, or some people study music in various parts of Tokyo, or in various parts of New York City, or various parts of Tibet. Um, perhaps I'm mistaken, but it seems to me that the younger generation in most countries in the world today, including young people in Japan, um, just aren't as interested in traditional music as they are in, I don't know if this is the proper term or not, but shall I call it Western or European pop music or something. Anyway, do you have any comment on this trend, Dr. Mom? Yes, uh, it's a very uh, logical first assumption, but actually, you see, we now live under mass communication and jet age. We now live in what Buckminster Fuller called a global village. So we are all close to each other in sound, at least. Uh, and in that context, we also live in a computer world now. So everything looks like it's going to be the same. The most interesting thing to me is that the young people, in fact, I find, are very much involved, not just in the United States, but in Japan and in Europe, in what I would call roots movements. Roots movements. They are trying to find some way to make themselves unique in a computer, plastic, mass communication world. The net result is that uh, we have more and more Americans singing folk music again, playing banjo again. We have more and more Europeans taking up the bagpipes and all kinds of things. And in France, taking the French uh, bagpipe. And, and here in Japan, you find more and more young people playing Matsuri Bayashi. Uh, Jangarabushi is, 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 is very, very popular in Tokyo. Urban folk music is very much there. And the, of course there's always popular music. And the international popular scene is very wide. But please notice that in 
each part of that world, the one you know here in Tokyo or in Japan, there is a special form of Japanese rock which isn't the same as British rock. It isn't the same as American rock. So within that international idiom, each group, even there, is shaping something to make it a little bit its own. And that makes me wonder, uh, what are some of the roles then uh, music plays in our daily life, or what is the importance of music for human beings? Well, music has the ability to communicate uh, feelings and emotions in a way that language cannot. What do you say after you say, I love you? It's amazing how many times you turn on a record. Mm -hmm. I still recall I was in Tokyo when President Kennedy was assassinated. And of course, naturally, I listened immediately to the Far Eastern Network because that was the English language programs coming from America. I was dying to know whether he was live or dead and so on. And what does a radio station do, a military radio station do, when the president of a country just died? Do you read a poem? Do you tell his life story? Do you have the weather report? Do you tell a sports broadcast? For the first time in history, all I could do was play slow movements from symphonies because there was no way they could say it. So Mark has always played that function. Whatever you try to say, I'm happy, I'm sad, whatever, it helps. It's essential. Um. I think, uh, speaking of human communication this way, that many people often say uh, music is an international language. Um, in what way do you think music can serve that purpose most effectively? Well, that's a very common statement, and you're quite correct in saying it. But I hate to tell you, it's not true. Music is not an international language. It consists of a whole series of equally logical equally logical, but different systems. Uh, for example, in communication level, if I were to give this broadcast in some African language like Swahili, it, it doesn't communicate much to you, but it does communicate to somebody there. And it, the fascination, each part of the world, every part of the world has some kind of music. Every part of the world has some kind of a language they speak in. But the fascination is each one comes out differently. And the fascination to us is to begin in this new mass communication world where you can hear the music of any part of the world here in Tokyo. You can hear the music of India. You can hear the music of China. You can hear the music of the Near East. You can hear the music of America here. Or the, even that, that small part of the world's music called the European, European art music. You can hear that here. But then the fascination is that you, if you begin to listen to it with a more open ear, you begin to find out that there are so many things to hear in music, but they're all different, and many of them are beautiful. And the most beautiful one for us right now, of course, is the music of Japan. Well, Professor Mom, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today, and I'm sure our listeners really enjoyed uh, listening to you, and thank you very much once again for being with us today. Thank you. Everybody, this concludes today's program. So long. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone.